Hi, I'm Ben. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I love reading literary fiction and I really enjoy following along with book prizes. And this year I am working my way through the Booker Longlist for 2024. My current read is actually my final book from the Longlist. It's Wandering Stars by Tommy Orange. Although I am going to read there, there in between parts one and two. So very shortly, the finishing line is going to get slightly further away, but then I am hoping to race through it in the next few days. Today though, I'm going to review three of the books from the Longlist these three, so let's get straight into it. First up is The Safe Keep by Yale van der Woden. This is the debut novel from this author, and I think one thing that's immediately quite interesting is that although the book is written in English, because if it wasn't, it wouldn't be eligible for the prize, the author is Dutch and the book is set in the Netherlands. This is set in 1961, at a time where Europe is still reckoning with and recovering from the Second World War. The protagonist we're following is Isabel, a middle-aged woman living alone in the house she spent most of her childhood and all of her adult life living in. And she's living alone at a time when it's viewed with some mixture of pity and suspicion not to be married by her age. She's a really interesting character. She's uptight and spiky and she's jealously protective of her house and its objects, like the treasured set of decorative plates adorned with hairs and kept in a glass cabinet. At the very start of the novel, she finds a shard of one of these plates in the garden soil. And she finds this kind of curious because none of the plates are broken and she has no memory of there ever being another one. She consults her brother Henrik about this just before they are due to meet up with their brother Louis for dinner. And he's bringing along his latest in a long string of short-lived girlfriends called Eva. I love a good dinner scene and this one is fantastic. And the reason it's so good is that van der Woden just knows how to write entertaining dialogue. Isabel is spiky and she's dismissive. Meanwhile, Eva has something odd and performative about her, playing the fool but with something else lurking under the surface. And Louis, well, he's just blinded by his infatuation. Lots of this isn't directly there on the page, but written instead into the subtext beneath the lines the characters are saying and their actions. I found this so entertaining and so impressive. This dinner is also the jumping off point for the main conflict of the novel, because after Isabel basically showed total disdain for Eva at dinner, her life is thrown into disarray when Louis has to go away for work and he ends up leaving Eva to stay at the house for a few weeks so that she's not alone with Louis's kinda creepy housemate. Isabel obviously completely hates this and Eva seems to purposefully push her to her limits, challenging her authority over the house. And all the while, items around the house are going missing, creating this sort of mystery element. I don't really want to say much more than that because a lot of my enjoyment of this book was in its unfolding. But there is a lot of heat and sexiness in this book. It has plenty of gothic sensibilities with the house haunted by ghosts of the past, like the room where Isabel's mother died, in which Eva is now staying. There are twists and turns, which I've seen some other people say were really obvious to them from the start, but which weren't to me until later in the book. So maybe I'm a little bit of a dummy, but I thought they were brilliant. And it asks big questions about the stories we project onto places and the legitimate claims over those places. I absolutely loved it. I thought the writing was spot on. It was precise and clear. It was laced with this acidity that made it very entertaining and a charm that made it feel like a much older book. This feels like a lost classic. And I think I might believe you if you told me that this was a novel from the 60s that had just been picked up and republished. It has some great comedy of manner sensibilities and some really cracking dialogue. Just top notch stuff. Next then, I read Playground by Richard Powers, and I should start this review by stating that I am a Richard Powers fan. Bewilderment is one of my all-time favourite books, and I really loved the overstory as well. I was fortunate enough to win a competition on Instagram a few months ago that landed me this absolutely gorgeous proof of the book, but it is out for real, I think, at the end of September. I don't know why it has taken me so long to read it, but the Booker nomination was just the kick up the bum that I needed. And I went into this with extremely high hopes, not least because early readers have been really raving about it. This, like the overstory, is a multi-stranded novel. It's about the ocean, about tech companies, AI, and it's about friendship. We start at the end meeting a small group of characters who live on a French Polynesian island, and they're grappling with an offer to become the center of industry for something called seasteading, these vast floating cities in the Pacific Ocean, which would have significant political autonomy away from traditional nation states, and which need to be built somewhere. We also hear the very intimate thoughts of a tech billionaire who is both behind the seasteading venture, but also has these deep personal connections with multiple people on the island. 
We alternate between these two perspectives, learning about the community debate on the island, as well as the histories of all of these characters and how they came to know and influence each other's lives. I have to admit, when I started this book, I struggled with it a little. Not because it's not readable, it absolutely is, perhaps compulsively so, given how quickly I flew through it, despite it being one of the longer books on the long list. But Power's prose is extremely earnest. Every sentence is imbued with import, every decision feeling like it's some grand fulcrum in the life of a character. And coming to this after the sharp and spiky and spicy prose of the safekeep just made it feel a little bit corny. It also didn't help that there is some truly toe-curling dialogue here, particularly said by Raffi, who is a black character. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that Powers can't write outside his experience, but whether an author is writing a character that is very like them or completely different from them, they do have a responsibility to make it good and believable, and plenty of lines of dialogue here are neither. There is a hint that Raffi is purposefully playing up to stereotypes, that he's performing some role that's expected of him, but I don't think it comes through strongly enough to overcome the fact that some of the dialogue is just plain bad. Thankfully though, I settled into the prose and that bad dialogue does drop off after the first 150 pages or so. And when I got into the groove of the novel, I found a lot to love. I loved how resonant the title Playground is throughout the entire story. It's in the way two of the main characters obsessively play chess and then they play Go. It's in the gamification of the social media empire one of the characters builds, but also how billionaires use Pacific Islands as their toys for capitalist endeavors. More beautifully, it's in how the oceans are the playground of life itself, life's birthplace, but also where it tries out so many new weird and wonderful features. I really enjoyed seeing democracy play out on the island, having this contained space used as a microcosm of society that's grappling with questions like whether children should have a say given they're most impacted by these long-term decisions and how long you should have had to live on the island before you can participate. The characters' lives are all really interesting, some parts perhaps a little melodramatic, but in general, I enjoyed learning about them and spending time with them. I loved Evelyn's story of being a woman who, as a girl, was the first person to use an aqualung, which later became scuba gear, and she found herself the foremost expert in a world dominated by men that she was more experienced than. It reminded me somehow of a bit of a mixture between Lee from In Ascension and Dolly Maunder, putting their professional careers ahead of their personal lives. And then I will also happily read a cutthroat tech bro storyline any day, and there is one in these pages. When I heard about this novel, I thought it sounded like it was to the ocean as the overstory is to the forest. And now that I've read it, it really is exactly that, which in many ways is wonderful, but at the same time, it's one of the biggest criticisms I could level at it. Some of these characters feel like retreads, and some of the lessons it's trying to teach its readers feel like they've already been given. It's not my favourite Powers novel, but I did really enjoy it in the end. And the ending was such a satisfying mixture of reveal and ambiguity that I was thinking about it for days after. Finally then, I read The Strange Eventful History by Claire Messard. This is one book that I had predicted to be on the list and was very excited about, but which my excitement for had been a little dampened by some other readers' reactions. It had been described by other reviewers as being a bit slow, a bit boring, frequently dropping characters that you're supposed to be invested in, and operating in the detail and at the margins. Now, I'm not going to say that all of those things are completely untrue, but they weren't true in a way that was bad for me, or that I'd describe in such pessimistic terms. Before I go any further, I should tell you what the book is about, and it is, at its core, a family saga, and it's one based, to some extent, on Clemerson's own personal family history, as captured in a 1500 page account written by her grandfather and left to Masud and her sister. The book opens with some reflections on storytelling and how we form our lives into narratives. It ruminates on where the right place is to start when history is so unceasing and continuous. I actually think the opening bit is a bit weak and a little bit cloying and it has this kind of funny energy that made me think of that TikTok meme where people are like, I'm a writer, of course I tell stories. Thankfully though, that bit is quite short and we very quickly get into our first drop in with the family. We meet Francois, the young son in a family of Pied Noir, people who were born and lived in Algeria during French colonial rule, but who were of French or European descent. This theme of being both from a place and not from a place is something the book returns to again and again, and I think it's one of the strongest things it does. Partly because it's a question that doesn't really have an answer and it just explores it in various ways. 
Francois' story begins on the day the Nazis take Paris, and from the relative safety of a small town in French Algeria, he's writing a letter to his father to let him know in case he hadn't heard the news. From there, we hop between family members and between cities and countries and decades, visiting them not necessarily at the most important moments of their lives, although there are plenty of those included, but at the fringes of world events. In some ways, this structure reminded me a little of One Day by David Nichols, and I'm not saying that if you liked One Day, you will like this. They are very different books. But it gave me a similar feeling in the way that you're like dropped into a specific time and place and you learn what's happened since the last chapter. I found that really effective, actually. The book doesn't give you any potted histories of what's gone on. It lands you in the current moment. It references things that have been happening without explaining too explicitly. And then things reveal themselves over the course of the chapter. For me, that was really good storytelling, giving these historical accounts a lot of immediacy. There is, of course, a lot that happens between the chapters, in the margins and off the page. And I can see why that's frustrating for some readers. But this is very knowingly done by Masood. There's a bit where the family are listening to the radio commentary for some sport and fog reduces the visibility of the game. The commentator says, it's all about what you can't see. Kind of funny because they were listening to the radio in the first place and not actually watching anything, but a very knowing nod to what Masood is doing throughout the whole book. History is always happening and it's always being recorded, whether you see it or not. And while we might focus on the big moments, meaning comes wherever we choose to look. I thought the character work was really good here and I enjoyed seeing the arcs of their lives. Some tragic, some unremarkable, but all grounded and convincing. One thing that I did find really satisfying was seeing some family traits cross the generations. As an example, Denise was Francois's sister and she was absolutely scared of everything. And then what we find is that Francois's daughter, who is Denise's niece, has the same type of fear. Cecilia is a self-insert of the author and she is written in the first person and so we get this really enjoyable interior view of that fear and how it plays out which puts more meat on the bones of Denise's character as well. Another character I really enjoyed my time with was Francois's wife Barbara. She is a woman whose ambition and tolerance had you really rooting for her but whose story was just heartbreaking and I found the elders of the family Francois and Denise's parents Gaston and Lucien a really interesting couple. Their love and marriage is completely mythologised by the family, their marriage described as the masterpiece of their lives. But we get glimpses of how it's not so perfect, and we see how that perception of perfection has some very real consequences for their children, who strive for it but just can't find it. There's also a very, let's say, interesting epilogue that casts a few things in a slightly different light. I do, however, appreciate that this book feels slow. It feels like it pulls a number of punches in what it chooses to depict and what it does not. And I'll admit that some parts of the book dragged a bit, felt a little slow. And in those instances, I did use the audio while I was reading as a bit of a pacemaker to keep up the momentum. But by and large, being slow wasn't a massive problem for me beyond the pressure at the back of my mind that I needed to crack through this one to get to the rest of the list. Your mileage, though, may vary. Overall, I thought this was a very accomplished family saga, tackling complex themes in a very human way. It wasn't my favourite, but I did really enjoy it. So that's another three reviews down. I'd love to hear from you in the comments if you have read any of these and what you thought of them. My sense so far from what I've seen online is that The Safe Keep is a bit of a reader favourite and This Strange Eventful History is a bit of a reader punching bag, but do let me know if your thoughts fall along those lines. I've got three more Booker Longlist reviews to come, which will be arriving as soon as I finish reading Wandering Stars. And then before we know it, the shortlist will be announced, which is a very exciting time. If you enjoyed this video, please do hit like and if you are not subscribed yet and you'd like to see more from me then hit the subscribe button but until next time toodles